When explaining behavior, many psychologists like to have a clear, precise explanation. You have the disorder because you've inherited a certain genetic pattern. You are aggressive because the consequences of previous acts of aggression in your life were positive and reinforced your aggressive behavior. Having a simple, reductionist explanation for behavior is helpful. We can test simple explanations, so a genetic test for the presence of certain genes in the population of people with a disorder, or studies that correlate adult aggression with childhood experiences. It even helps with treatments. If the genes code for neurotransmitter levels, then we can use drug treatments to fix an imbalance. But isn't all this a little too simplistic? The experience and causes of, for example, a mental health condition often seem complex and to interact. Perhaps genes do play a role, but so does coping techniques learned in childhood, along with adult life events, and even the way wider culture deals with mental health in general. It might seem more valid, so closer to the truth, to say that there are multiple causes of all behaviours, and these causes all interact with each other. The problem is, how could we ever scientifically test all of these causes and interactions when scientific testing requires isolating one variable? This is the debate. Reductionism or holism? The PsychBoost flashcard app has a new feature. Test yourself with over 1,500 multiple choice questions, including every topic on A-level and GCSE psychology. Try Paper 1 for free right now. And patron supporters can watch PsychBoost videos ad-free, learn from over 17 hours of exclusive exam tutorial videos, and access hundreds of digital and printable resources, including mind maps, quiz sheets, worksheets, teaching slides, and more. Reductionism. Reductionism is based on a scientific principle, parsimony. The argument that the best explanation is the simplest one that fits the evidence. To be reductionist means studying complex things or phenomena by breaking them down to their simplest components and testing the individual elements empirically. Taking a reductionist approach has been very successful in other sciences. Using the principles of physics, the complexity of the physical world can be reduced to some relatively simple equations. Now, there are no simple equations that explain all of human behavior, but we can use basic explanations for behavior that focus on testing simple mechanisms with very few assumptions. Biological psychologists use biological reductionism. So, as an example, their explanation of depression would be someone who has inherited a set of genes influencing their neurochemistry. This neurological imbalance resulted in depression. So biological reductionism is simplifying or reducing human behavior to the level of simple biological variables. You have the gene that codes the neurotransmitter, or you don't. Behaviorists like Pavlov and Skinner argue for environmental reductionism. They explain behavior as being due to simple stimulus response mechanisms. A behaviorist argument for aggression would be someone became a criminal adult because they learned their criminal acts in childhood were rewarded, not punished. So their criminal behavior was reinforced and became more common. Biological and environmental reductionism are the best examples of reductionism in psychology, and we should focus on these in any essay we need to write. Cognitive psychology's explanations are not quite as simplistic, but we can talk about machine reductionism. This includes the computer analogy, how cognitive psychologists explain the brain as working like the CPU of a computer, and full processes as like the software that runs on the brain. The computer analogy, along with explaining processes as complex as human memory, with mechanistic theoretical models like the working model of memory, is reductionist. There is, of course, an alternative to reductionism. Holism. The counter to reductionism, holism, argues a truly valid explanation of human behavior needs to include the whole person. So this includes biological processes, the role of reinforcement, internal mental processes, including emotions, and even the broader social context behind the behavior. To be fully holistic, an explanation of any behavior would include all of these factors and how these components interact with each other. The humanists are the best example of the holistic approach in psychology. They argue it's only by studying the whole person that we can really understand the human experience. It's for this reason that humanistic psychologists like Maslow and Rogers prefer investigating behavior with case studies and interviews. These methods tend to produce information that's richer and more detailed. This type of ideographic investigation, along with nomothetic investigation, will be the focus of the next video. Levels of explanation. To help you understand the distinction between holism and reductionism, it's going to be helpful to think about the concept of levels of explanation. We can be asked to define this term, 
And honestly, it's a little complex. If we just want to define Laval's explanation, we could say, explanations vary from those at a lower or fundamental level, focusing on basic components or units, to those at a higher, more holistic, multivariable level. I do want you to fully understand what I've just said, and that's going to take a bit of a conversation. Let's start with an example from outside psychology. If we want to explain the growth of plants, we could ask different scientists, and we would get different explanations. An ecologist would explain the wider ecosystem is a part of. Horticultural scientists would explain the plant's immediate environment and the nutrients it has access to. A plant cellular biologist would describe the individual biological structures and the functions of the cells it's constructed of. A geneticist would explain how certain genes code for leaf size, water retention, and photosynthesis. If we want to be even more reductionist, a chemist could explain the plant as a sum of its chemical processes. A physicist would go to an even lower level and explain the plant as simply the interactions between its atoms. Now, I think you can agree that all of these explanations are very different, but in their own way, they're all true. They're not disagreeing, they're telling the same story, but from a different perspective. When we say the lowest level is more fundamental, this is because a physicist could argue if we had a complete knowledge of all interactions between all atoms in the universe, we could work everything else out from that. But I don't want you to get too hung up on that. Let's go back to psychology, because if you're writing about levels of explanation, don't mention the plants. I use that to help you visualize levels of explanation. In psychology, we study behavior. This could be anything from aggression, addiction, or depression. If we think carefully, we can see that psychologists from very different approaches are actually explaining the same behaviors from different levels of explanation. They're not necessarily disagreeing. Let's say, for example, a violent criminal shows aggression. A social psychologist might explain that aggression is due to cultural factors, a result of growing up with peers and family and a wider society that respects the most aggressive members of their community. A cognitive psychologist would argue that the criminal has acquired a set of schemas about how to interpret different situations, and these schemas are biased towards a negative, aggressive interpretation and response. A behaviorist would explain aggression as a series of learned responses. The criminal is being rewarded for previous acts of aggression, reinforcing aggressive behaviors and making them more likely. A biological psychologist would suggest that behaviors due to the interactions of physical brain structures and neurochemicals, and more fundamentally, due to our genetic inheritance, both making us capable of violence and making it a viable option if it's likely to make us more likely to survive and pass on our genes to the next generation. While appearing very separate, these explanations are, in some ways, the same argument. Start from the bottom up. Our genes are fixed, but these genes code for human brains, and it's been an evolutionary advantage for these biological neural networks to be flexible. They develop in response to the world around us. We need to have the capacity to be violent in case we're born into an aggressive society, but also work cooperatively if we find ourselves in a more prosocial society. The brain has reward systems, such as serotonin and dopamine, which are released when we perform an action that leads to us satisfying our basic need, making us feel good. A similar set of neurological, so biological processes, produce a sensation of pain and anxiety, both unpleasant experiences. The brain as a biological machine will attempt to maximize the pleasant sensations and minimize the unpleasant experiences. So the connections in the brain that produce aggressive behavior become stronger if they ultimately result in pleasant sensations and weaker if negative. When a behaviorist argues that a creature's aggressive behavior is due to stimulus response mechanisms, they're saying there are some stimuli that produce a pleasant experience and some negative. These experiences are biological processes the creature learns to repeat the behaviors that produce the pleasant stimuli, reinforcement, and to avoid behaviors that lead to unpleasant stimuli. The creature learns to repeat behaviors that produce pleasant stimuli, reinforcement, and to avoid behaviors that lead to unpleasant stimuli. We do learn that there are secondary enforcers like money and group status, but those things are reinforcing only because they give access to primary enforcers like food and sex, that provide biological rewards like dopamine release. Going up a level to cognitive psychologists, the sets of schema are the mental software that runs on the biological hardware of the brain. The reason a set of aggressive schemas are formed is because a set of neurons have formed stronger connections than a set of passive schemas. Schemas are built from previous experiences, so experiencing or observing acts of aggression that have been rewarding 
produce schema that lead to aggression. Going up again to social explanations, family, peers, and wider society sets the environment for the individual to develop in. Whether aggression is rewarding or punishing is largely dependent on the values and responses of the people around the individual. If every time the individual has seen aggression or was aggressive themselves in the past, they were surrounded by people who disapproved of and punished them, they would have been socialized to be less aggressive. If, on the other hand, they had seen that aggressive people had high status, and when they were aggressive, they received rewards for that aggression, they would build synaptic connections that represented schema for aggressive behavior. Okay, I know that was pretty intense, and I know that some people are just trying to get through their A-level, and I don't want the complex idea of levels of explanation to give you anxiety. And if that's the case, please just try to remember the first sentence I gave you. But hopefully what I've said has helped some of you understand the concept a little better. Evaluations. I imagine you've often used reductionism as a criticism, but in fact, there are very good reasons to be reductionist. Taking a reductionist approach allows psychologists to identify individual variables that can be tested objectively under experimental conditions ultimately allowing the researcher to establish a cause and effect relationship. Using the previous examples, neurotransmitter levels can be measured precisely. Stimulus response mechanisms can be investigated with Skinner boxes, and the components of models of memory can be tested under controlled laboratory conditions. As this empirical method is a principle of science, taking a reductionist approach to explain human behavior has helped psychology become more respected as a science. There've also been practical applications, Taking a reductionist approach allows for the development and empirical testing of treatments like drug therapies. Drug therapies are based on reductionist theories, and altering neural mechanisms has led to effective treatments that have helped millions control the symptoms of a range of mental health issues. As you can imagine, many psychologists argue that taking a completely reductionist approach to any behavior is too simplistic. By focusing on only one variable at a time, a reductionist approach ignores other potentially valid explanations and the way that multiple causes of behavior might interact. A focus on biology might overlook the importance of cognitive processes, and a focus on stimulus response learning may ignore the role of inherited instincts, social factors, and the unconscious. Viewing the brain like a computer is limited as the mind experiences emotions and has reconstructive and inaccurate memory. We could also argue reductionism leads to a loss of meaning, for example, describing the formation of romantic or infant mother relationships as simply a set of inherited drives or learnt responses to stimuli doesn't have face validity. It simply can't fully explain the experience of forming and experiencing an attachment. Most people would agree that each meaningful relationship in their lives is unique and complex. And the same is true of other behaviours, such as the individual's experience of mental health, sexuality and personality. A final criticism is reductionism ignores emergent properties. Taking another non-psychological example, each bird in a flock follows the same straightforward rules in flight to avoid hitting another bird. What we can see here are murmurations. These patterns can't be seen from the simple rules of one bird. This complexity emerges from thousands of birds acting together. There are features of human experience, like consciousness. The simple processes of individual neurons can't explain consciousness. But like murmurations, consciousness might be an emergent property, so an explanation that includes interaction is needed. The advantages and disadvantages of taking a holistic approach are reflections of reductionism. So I'll rewrite them here from the perspective of holism. When a researcher is considering how to carry out their research, they need to consider the trade-offs between reductionism and holism and how hopefully to try to balance the reductive, objective and empirical methods, but also attempt to gather meaningful information. I want to thank everyone over on Patreon for supporting the channel. Because of you, I've been able to teach part-time, meaning I can make Psychboost on YouTube for everyone. I do have extra resources that are exclusive for my patrons, so if you've decided to sign up, you can grab those over on my website. And these include over 100 exam question tutorial videos. Of course, including questions on the Issues and Debates unit. I hope this was helpful and I will see you in the next Psych Boost video.